Good evening. It's good to be in the company of friends, old friends and new friends. I'd just like to draw your attention back to the final verse in the passage that we had read to us from 2 Kings. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, uh, verse 15. This phrase, there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. There's perhaps no more typical standard statement of Old Testament Israelite faith than that. The statement that there is one God in all of the earth and that that one God is the God of Israel. You can find that sort of statement throughout Almost every single book of the Old Testament, one of the most famous passages of the Old Testament is that passage known as the Shema, which is in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. There is one God, and he is the God of Israel. But although it is a very typical statement for us to read in the Old Testament, Verse 15, where it appears there, is is actually very surprising and very unlikely. And the reason is we don't find those words on the lips of an Abraham or a Moses. We don't, uh, we're not reading here a psalm of King David or a prophetic utterance of Israel's great prophet Isaiah. We find these words on the lips of a Gentile leader, a leader of the Syrian army, a non-Israelite, somebody who was outside of God's covenant people, somebody who was, to use the words of the Apostle Paul from Ephesians chapter 2, an alien to the commonwealth of Israel, a stranger to the covenants of promise, without God and without hope in the world. So it is actually a very surprising statement And it is a very controversial one. In his first sermon, Jesus Christ himself referred to Naaman. And when he did, it nearly caused a riot. He actually had to escape, Luke chapter 4, from the crowds before they could kill him prematurely. And the reason that it was so controversial is because it reveals something about the surprising and unsettling nature of God's grace. And we're going to look at three aspects of God's grace as we work through this passage this evening, which are these three. First of all, it is a sovereign grace. Second of all, a unique grace. And third of all, it is free grace. First of those, sovereign grace. We meet Naaman. He is a very impressive man indeed a great man with his master, in high favour. He's experienced military victories. He's at the top of his game in the army, the equivalent, perhaps, of a field marshal. And surprisingly, being given the fact he's a Syrian, he's been given military victories from the Lord. He has favour from God, and also favour with his fellow men. If he came in here this evening, we'd think, wow, what a man. What a great man. But there is this one debilitating weakness that he has that threatens to undermine everything. And there it is at the end of verse 1. He was a leper. Now what we're going to see in this passage, as God works through his sovereign grace to reach Naaman, is that God is not interested in opening up a conversation with Naaman. He's not coming to Naaman and saying, hi Naaman, maybe you'd like to think about getting to know me. Um, Perhaps we could have a talk and see how things go. You can ask your questions. I'll be very willing to listen to uh, you and we'll talk things through and see where we get to. Now, rather, God is kicking open the door to Naaman's life, bursting in 
and hunting him down to bring him to the point where he reaches that statement that we read in verse 15, there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. And that is the way God works throughout the whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, and it is the way that God works throughout the whole of human history. He works sovereignly. When he saves people, it's not because humans initiate a relationship with God, it's not because uh, we uh, get things rolling, but it's because God draws us to himself. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him, and all that the Father has given me will come. God sets people within his sights when he's going to save them, and he draws them to himself sovereignly. That is his sovereign grace, and it's that sovereign grace that we see at work, but in a rather surprising way. We read of a little girl who is working in his house. A little girl who has been carried away from her home and family, snatched by the Syrian army when they raided Israel. And she is going to be the unlikely means of God's sovereign grace in Naaman's life. And it's unlikely because if we'd read the Bible from the beginning of Genesis right up to this point, we would have seen what happens when people mess with God's people. We would see what happens when people invade God's people or persecute them. We would have read Exodus. And perhaps we would be expecting now God to bring down his judgment upon Naaman, to send one of those great plagues that he sends in the book of Exodus. Perhaps we would expect that that's why Naaman has leprosy as a punishment for what he has done uh, to the nation of Israel. But rather, God has brought this girl into his life, not to be a reason for his judgment, but to be a channel of his blessing. It is this, through this little girl and through the unlikely circumstances that are being arranged within God's sovereign grace that God reaches out to Naaman and can save him. And this is how God works today. It may be that you are here and you don't know uh, the Lord Jesus Christ for yourself. And it may just be that the Lord is governing the circumstances of your life in such a way that you would be here this evening to hear the gospel preached and so that you would respond with faith and obedience in the same way that Naaman did. It might be that God is orchestrating the events of your life to bring you to know him. I do hope that that is the case, because as we'll see, it is the most wonderful blessing that he brings to us of salvation through his sovereign grace. Well, not only is his grace sovereign, but it is also a unique grace. Well, by unique grace, what do I mean? Well, I'm referring to the fact that Naaman, when he hears that there's this prophet in Israel from this little girl who... uh, God has brought into his house, who not only knows about this prophet who can help him, but surprisingly is willing to help him, uh, given what she has been through. He doesn't say, well, I'll get in touch with one of our local religious priests here in Syria, and I'll see whether he can channel into the God of Israel. Neither does he say, well, why don't we go and capture this prophet and bring him over to Syria, and then he can heal me here. No, he journeys out to go to Israel, because he recognises that Israel has been the place where God has displayed uniquely his saving grace. It is Israel that he has chosen to be his covenant people. It was Abraham and to his descendants that he gave the promise of a land and of salvation. Israel is the theatre in which God is displaying his saving grace. So Naaman sets out there, and when he arrives, he goes to speak to the king, and there seems to be some confusion because the king has received this uh, letter from Naaman that's written to him from the king of Syria saying, please can you help out Naaman? Can you please heal him? 
And the king, understandably, is distressed by that. And he tears his shirt and says, what on earth are you talking about? I, I, I'm not God. He says, am I God that I should kill and make alive? And here we have a recognition that although Israel has been the place where God has uniquely revealed his saving grace, it is not because of any merit or strength or ability that Israel had. There's no reason within Israel why they should have had that saving grace. It is entirely a gift of God. Think about it, the most powerful man in Israel, the king, the most powerful man in God's chosen people, can do absolutely nothing to help Naaman. It has to be God's work and God's work alone. Fortunately, Elijah, uh, sorry, Elisha, should get that right, uh, the prophet, hears about this and he goes to see uh, the king and says, or he gets in touch with the king and says, can I see Elijah? So Elijah goes to, uh, Naaman goes to Elisha's front door and knocking at the door, now just imagine this, you're knocking at uh, the door, you're Naaman, and you look down at your hand as you pound on the door, and you can't feel it because you're, you're a leper and the nerve ends have been, uh, in your fingers have been destroyed, and you see the corruption in your flesh, and you're thinking, please, please God, can this be, can this be my healing? Can this work? So he's waiting, and a messenger comes down from Elisha. And the messenger, uh, we see in uh, verse 10, has good news for him on one level. He's going to tell him how he can get healed. And this way that he tells him that he can get healed, the, the particular thing that Naaman has to go and do, reveals something of the uniqueness of God's grace, God's unique grace again. There it is in verse 10. Go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman isn't particularly fond of the uniqueness and the particularity of that message. He says, Are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? I've got rivers. I've got great rivers. Think of Damascus. It's such a a dry land, yet we have this river that comes through and provides irrigation and enables fertility in the land. What's wrong with our river? You just... You, I came all this way for a river. Now, I think there's a very contemporary ring to Naaman's complaint there. And I think we'll recognize it if I word his complaint this way. Can't I get to God my own way? Can I, do, do I really need this sort of particular, narrow, unique, sort of one way of being saved? Can I not get to God my own way? Naaman recognised there's plenty of great rivers out there. Why do I need to come to the Jordan? Well, this is the way with salvation throughout the whole Bible. There is one way of salvation that is ultimately revealed through the Lord Jesus Christ the God-man who uniquely reveals the unique grace of God through his mighty death and resurrection, dealing with our sin, dealing with the penalty for our sin, and raising from the dead to be the unique saviour of the world who will come again to judge the living and the dead. Now Naaman said... There are other rivers. And today many people will look at Christianity and say there are other religions, there are other ways to God. 
What's wrong with them? Why, why this particularity? Why this unique one way? Why this narrow approach to religion? You even will get Christians who will say, well, sure, Jesus is the one only way, but there are many ways to Jesus. So actually, um, you know, many people can come to Jesus through different paths and people may actually follow Jesus without even realizing it. They may think that they're following Muhammad when secretly actually they're following Jesus. Or uh, they may think that they are um, just being a good moral person when really, without knowing it, they are sort of tuning in to Jesus. Well, that's ridiculous. If you look at the New Testament, it's, uh, clearly you have to profess faith in the Lord Jesus. There is no salvation in heaven and on earth uh, other than in the... Uh, there's no name in, he- in heaven and on earth in which salvation can be found other than the name of Jesus. There is no name. There is a name that has to be named. All those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I don't think Naaman could have sort of gone down to the River Jordan and dipped in it seven times without realising what he was, was doing, without consciously doing it as an act of faith. And that's what it requires for us today too, a conscious act of faith in the Lord Jesus as the one and only saviour of the world. But I'd just like to point out how that is actually good news. I think... We look at that and it seems very narrow. But it is a wonderful thing. And I want to give two reasons. First of all, it is extremely clear. God doesn't... If it, well, if, if God had said there are many ways, that would be potentially quite confusing. Well, it, precisely how many ways are there? How will I know which are the true ways to God and which aren't the true ways to God? There is a wonderful clarity in the gospel. There is one way of salvation, the Lord Jesus, through his death and resurrection. But there's also this. We're talking about God's unique grace here. And things are unique often, not always, but often, because they're very special and precious. And the reason why we can talk about God's grace being unique, so unique, is that it has come through the most precious gift, the most precious expression of the love of God, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I really don't think that there will be anybody who will stand before the Lord Jesus on Judgment Day and look at the scars on his hands and the scars in his feet and look at him in the eyes and say, you didn't do enough. Why didn't you do more? Why wasn't there more than one way? And I don't think there will be anybody after that who will turn to God the Father, who gave up his precious Son, who from all eternity had loved his Son and shared in the fellowship of the Holy Trinity, yet gave him over to become a man, to be hated, to be tortured, and to die for our sins. I don't think there will be anyone who will look at God the Father and say, you didn't do enough. God was willing to spare his own precious son for us. It is a unique grace. It is particular. It is, in a sense, narrow, but it is glorious. Well, Naaman had seen that God's work in his life was sovereign. He'd seen that God had brought him over to Israel through this unlikely means that he could have had no control over. He just so happened to have this girl in his, working in his house who knew about this prophet and was willing to tell him. And he comes to see that God's grace is also unique. He does go down to the river and he dips in it seven times and You can imagine that by the fifth and sixth time he's there thinking, this would better work. I'm going to feel pretty stupid if this doesn't work. And he goes down the seventh time and comes back up. And it says in verse 14, at the end, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. 
he goes to Elijah and he says, that saying that I read out at the beginning, there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. He sees the unique grace of God. But what he hasn't seen yet is the free grace of God. And I think this is one of the hardest things for us all to grasp. And it was certainly hard for Naaman to understand. You see, he turns around to Elijah, Elisha. At the end of verse uh, uh, 15, and says, Now accept a present from your servant. You may remember that he, when coming over from Syria, had brought with him ten talents of silver. That's about 750 kilograms, apparently. He'd also brought 6,000 shekels of gold, which was worth the a cumulative value of the annual wages of 600 labourers. You can imagine what Elisha's thinking this time. You know, it's his chance to get lucky. I mean, bear in mind that just before this passage, Elisha had seen a famine in chapter 4 towards the end. He's seen poverty uh, up front of the most severe kind, And you would forgive him for thinking here, well, this could be a rather tasty um, insurance against that happening again. But he says, in verse 16, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. The grace of God is free. It is absolutely free. But so often we do want to buy it. We act as if we can buy it. We think we have to do something for it. We think we have to be good enough, do enough good works. We think that perhaps if we're nice enough, if we do enough for charity, or if we attend church, if we read the Bible enough, if we pray enough, that we will somehow buy salvation from God. Now that is the total reversal of the truth because salvation is God's purchase of us. We cannot buy God. God has bought us. If we are Christians, it's because God has bought us through the precious blood of his son, through something of infinite value. Now, how can we expect with our meagre efforts? How could Naaman expect with Although a great amount of money on the scale of value is insignificant compared to the infinite value and worth of Jesus Christ. How can he expect to pay for his salvation? It is absolutely free. This takes us back to Jesus' sermon because when Jesus referred to this passage... In his sermon in Luke chapter 4, when he had to run away and escape from the crowd, it was because the crowd were not at all comfortable with the fact that grace is free, that God's salvation is something that is offered to us to be received by faith, by freely receiving it. The people at the time wanted to believe that it was something that was inherited by virtue of being an Israelite, by virtue of being a Jew. There was an Anglican bishop, I think, who uh, once made this comment about, uh, it was actually about the the Apostle Paul, but I think it applies to Jesus as well. Wherever he preached, there was a riot. Wherever I preached, they served tea. Uh, It's true. But I I think there's something interesting there because the gospel of grace should provoke a reaction. It should be provocative. It should shock us. God doesn't expect anything of us when we come to him. He doesn't say, come and, often people do say this, but it's wrong, I come and get, sort of get right with God. 
We do not get right with God. God gets us right with himself. He works in us and for us to forgive us of our sins and to transform us. And it should be provocative because it says we have absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing to offer God. Nothing at all. Think about it. God's grace is sovereign. That means he begins the process. He, in his sovereign grace, doesn't look at us and choose the ones he likes. He chooses freely, has chosen freely, out of his mercy. He has sent his son for us, out of his mercy, before we even had the opportunity to think about him or to to consider putting our faith in him. He has worked sovereignly through his grace. It's utterly unique. There's only one way, and it is absolutely free. We have absolutely nothing to offer him, but he gives us everything we need, everything freely, just as he did with Naaman. There was no price. He freely received the salvation God gave him, freely received the cleansing of leprosy. And of course, leprosy throughout the scriptures is parabolic of the condition that we are all in as a result of our sin. It is a faint analogy, really, because the severity of sin is so much greater, even if it may not seem so. And so God would say to us this evening through these scriptures, come to the Jordan. Come to the one who fulfilled everything that this Jordan uh, and this healing and the the prophet and the king were pointing forwards to, the Lord Jesus Christ. And be washed, not through the waters, but through his blood, being cleansed from our sins. Let's pray. Father God, we... Thank you for this story from the Old Testament. We thank you that although it may seem so far away from our experience and so strange, yet it speaks to us so mightily of the Lord Jesus. And we pray that you would help each one of us this evening to put our trust in his grace so that we might know cleansing from our sin and the hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.